This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for October 16th through the 22nd. On this week's show, two decisions concerning one item save some lives but doom others, plus hot grits can make you feel born again, but not quite in the way that you think. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. There are times in your life when making one decision, whether you know it or not, probably ended up saving it. For some, it's taking a left instead of a right or waiting 20 seconds instead of 30 seconds on a street corner for something. For me, it was when I took a current job instead of taking a job that at the time was on an upper floor of the old World Trade Center. You just never know. In music, I know of four decisions that have saved someone's life. One is when Mark Wahlberg missed one of those flights from Boston on 9-11 that eventually crashed into the World Trade Center. Another is Waylon Jennings giving up his seat on a plane that later crashed, killing Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens. Yet another is when Eric Clapton gave up his seat on a helicopter that later crashed, killing Stevie Ray Vaughan. And the fourth is the basis of this next story. In the mid-1970s, the band Leonard Skinner was doing pretty well. They released their debut album in 1973 and scored a huge hit with the song Freebird, otherwise known as that song some drunken idiot always yells at any concert, even hip-hop ones. Play Freebird! They followed it up with more albums and became a huge band, especially in the southern rock area. All of this success came after years of touring around the South, working on their shows and making them much better. In October of 1977, they released their fifth album. They decided to go out on tour to support the album, as bands always do. It was going to be their biggest tour yet. Unfortunately for them, a decision they made would end up tragically costing them some of their lives. However, an earlier decision probably ended up saving another band that was getting big right around the same time. During that same time period, a band out of Boston named Aerosmith was getting big. Starting in 1973 with their debut album, the band was on a roll, and in 1977, they released the album Draw the Line. They also decided to go out on tour, which is when they got the nickname the Toxic Twins due to all the drugs that they were taking and all the infighting. Here's where making a decision changed everything. Since Aerosmith was going on tour, they decided to look for a charter airplane to fly them around in. They looked at a Convair CV-300 that was kept in Addison, Texas, but decided not to use it due to, quote, concerns about the crew, end quote. That decision, as it turns out, was good for Aerosmith, but bad for Leonard Skinner because this was the plane and the crew that Leonard Skinner decided to use. On October 17, 1977, Leonard Skinner released a new album called Street Survivor and immediately went out on tour to support it. Exactly three days after the release of that album, they boarded the Convair CV-300 on a flight from Greenville, South Carolina to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they were to play a concert at LSU, Louisiana State University. As the plane was at 6,000 feet, the pilots radioed in that they were running out of fuel and losing altitude. About 13 minutes after that report, the plane crashed outside of Gillsburg, Mississippi. Among the people killed in the crash were the pilot and the co-pilot, whom the National Transportation Board held responsible for the crash. Also killed were band lead singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Steve Gaines, backup singer and Steve Steve's older sister, Cassie Gaines, and the band's assistant road manager, Dean Kilpatrick. Twenty other people on the plane did end up surviving the crash. 
The immediate result of the crash was that Leonard Skinner broke up for a decade before getting back together. In the interim, some of the surviving members of the band formed the Rosington Collins Band. When the band did get back together, Ronnie Van Zandt's younger brother Johnny became the new lead singer. Still, something about that plane and its crew made Aerosmith's people not use the plane, but it didn't seem to bother Leonard Skinner's people. If you could only take back some decisions. Two decisions about one plane changed the lives of many, saving some, dooming others. The plane crash that claimed the lives of four members of Leonard Skinner plus the pilot and the co-pilot happened on October 20th, 1977. A quick mention of an event that has a musical side note as well. On October 17, 1989, a 6.9 earthquake hit the San Francisco Bay Area, killing 63 people and injuring 3,800 others. It was the strongest earthquake in the area since the 1906 earthquake that created the fire that practically wiped out the entire city of San Francisco. From a musical standpoint, the band Four Non Blondes was supposed to have their very first practice together in the Bay Area that day, but ended up postponing it, mainly because of the earthquake, obviously. The earthquake wasn't a bad omen for them, though. They eventually hit it big with the song What's Up, and lead singer and songwriter Linda Perry became an award-winning producer and songwriter in her own right. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This next incident tells a tale of how people can become born again. If you are yourself born again or change religions for whatever reason, it may have been a traumatic event that may have pushed you to convert. You probably didn't have an event quite like this next one, though. There once was a time when the Reverend Al Green was simply known as Al Green. He was born Albert Leornis Green on April 13, 1946 in Forest City, Arkansas, and started out singing in his group, the Green Brothers, which included his sister during high school. He was kicked out of his house and had to fend for himself when his extremely religious father caught him listening to secular music, specifically Jackie Wilson. While still in high school, Al moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and eventually went to live with a prostitute. Al also started another group called Al Green and the Creations, and it was through that group that he was noticed by Memphis record producer Willie Mitchell, who signed him to a recording contract with High Records, and he dropped the letter E at the end of his name and began spelling it like the color green rather than Lorne Green, famous actor of Battlestar Galactica and Bonanza and a couple other things. Al found early success with his debut single in 1967, Backup Train, which went to number five on the American R&B singles chart. From there, Al went on a roll, including six straight number one albums on the American R&B charts. He also had his now classic hits from the late 1960s to mid-1970s, such as Let's Stay Together, Tired of Being Alone, Love and Happiness, Look What You've Done for Me, You Ought to Be With Me, Call Me, Here I Am, Living for You, Let's Get Married, Sha La La, L-O-V-E, Full of Fire, Take Me to the River, and I'm Still in Love with You, among many, many others. By the mid-1970s, Al Green was looked at as the next version of Sam Cooke and his idol, Jackie Wilson. He had the vocal style, and he also had the sex appeal, and he, like Sam and Jackie, developed a following, especially with his stage shows. 
There was a sexual tension, you might say, with the ladies that drove them wild. And that is pretty much where his troubles started. Now, if you yourself are born again or change religions for whatever reason, like I said, it may have been a traumatic event. This incident, though, ended up stopping Al's career cold. You see, there was a lady by the name of Mary Woodson White, and she, like most women of the era, fell in love with Al. Problem. She was married, and she also had kids, but apparently that did not stop her from going after Al. One day, she left her husband and kids in New Jersey and drove all the way up to upstate New York for Al's show. Somehow, they met. One thing led to another, and they became lovers because, hey, music, man, groupies, you know. Somewhere along the line, she either became an ex-girlfriend of his or they were still sort of seeing each other, depending on whose version of the story you're going with, I guess. Be that as it may, on the night of October 18, 1974, when Al got back to his house in Memphis, Tennessee, after flying all night from a concert in San Francisco, who was waiting for him at his own door? Yeah, you guessed it, it was Mary. Here's where the story gets weird. Only two people truly know what went down, but here's the gist of the events that evening as we sort of know them. Something prompted Mary to snap. The rumor is that Mary wanted Al to marry her, even though she was still married at the time. Anyway, Al, for some reason, went off to take a bath. Sometime during that bath, Mary came into the bathroom with a pot of hot grits. Again, not sure if the grits were made by her or by him before he went to take the bath. Still, Mary poured the boiling hot water onto Al, leaving him with severe burns. Mary then went to Al's bedroom where she found his gun. Again, not sure if she knew that he had a gun. She took the 38 caliber pistol, pointed it at herself, and killed herself with it. According to some reports, Mary left a note in her purse detailing what she would do, so I guess this wasn't exactly a spur-of-the-moment type of thing. Once Al recovered from his burns, he decided that the event was a sign from God that he had strayed way too far down the path of sin and needed to get back on the right path. He had technically been born again a year earlier, but now he decided to fully commit. At the height of his soul singing career, he quit singing soul music and started doing gospel music. Not only that, but he also decided to become a preacher. He became an ordained minister in 1976. Talk about totally committing. He eventually went back to performing secular soul music, but he still preaches to this day. And now you know what prompted Al Green to become the Reverend Al Green. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that even after his religious conversion, he still had issues. He was accused by his now ex-wife, Shirley, who married him after he became a minister, of repeated physical and emotional abuse, including hitting her with a boot after refusing to have sex with him because she was five months pregnant at the time with their child. He admitted to the spousal abuse while under oath during their divorce filing in 1982. Hmm. The Grits incident that burned the Reverend Al Green happened on October 18th, 1974. Finally, there are a boatload of birthdays to celebrate this week, so before I highlight a couple of them, I'm just going to wish all of these people a happy birthday first. Starting with October 16th, where we have John Mayer, Bob Weir from The Grateful Dead, Bob Mould from Husker Du, and Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers celebrating birthdays. Oh, also, for all you Wilson Phillips fans out there, Wendy Wilson also has her birthday on that date. 
October 17th as Eminem, Wyclef Jean of the Fugees, Ziggy Marley, and Chris Kirkpatrick of NSYNC. October 17th also happens to be the birthday of one David St. Hubbins of the band Spinal Tap. He's otherwise known as actor-singer Michael McKeon. On October 18th, it's Neo's birthday, along with singer Laura Nero and Zac Efron from High School Musical. There's another legend whose birthday it is, but we'll get to him later. October 19th rolls in with reggae great Peter Tosh, while October 20th sees birthdays for Snoop Dogg and one other artist who we're going to get to in a minute. October 21st has the great Dizzy Gillespie and the Queen of Salsa, the iconic Miss Celia Cruz. It's also Doja Cat's birthday along with Kane Brown's birthday. October 22nd is classical composing great Franz Litt's birthday along with rappers 21 Savage and Roddy Rich and DJ Laidback Luke. Let's go back to October 20th for a minute specifically to October 20th, 1950. Tom Petty was one of those guys I think people always took for granted. He wasn't revered like, say, Bono or Paul McCartney. Even once he passed away on October 2nd, 2017, people automatically went to his hits free-falling and I won't back down, thinking that that's all the guy's ever done. Well, they're wrong. Very, very wrong. Tom Petty, both with and without his group, The Heartbreakers, did so much more. In fact, every musician alive owes whatever money they make to him for one reason. He fought for his rights, and along the way in the process, he fought for theirs as well. I could go on about all the hits he had, like Last Dance with Mary Jane, Don't Come Around Here No More, You Got Lucky, American Girl, Breakdown, and many others. But I'm going to stick with one event, his bankruptcy. Here's what happened. When he signed his first record deal, what he didn't realize was that he had signed away all of his songwriting rights for $10,000. That meant that for any and all past and future royalties, whatever he made, his record company and the people who basically screwed him out of all his money would make 100 times as much. Tom sued to get out of his contract. Then the record company sued him right back, claiming breach of contract. What he and his manager did next was sheer genius. Tom Petty declared bankruptcy. Now, normally, you would think that it's a bad thing to do that. What this did, though, was at that time, all contracts and debts had to be renegotiated, which protected Petty from both the record company's lawsuit and would also mean a much smaller piece of the pie for them. The record companies didn't want any other artists trying that little trick, so they struck a deal with Petty out of court. Petty got all his own record label imprints, but more importantly, he got his songwriting and his publishing rights back. In short, Tom Petty beat the record labels at their own game, and that is why he's important to rock and roll, and that's what makes the lyrics to his song I Won't Back Down even more important in this day and age. Unfortunately, his death came much like Prince's from an addiction that a lot of people have fallen victim to, opioids, and it happened way too early, like a lot of people. They eventually contributed to his death from cardiac arrest on October 2nd, 2017. Happy birthday, and thank you very much, Tom Petty. Thanks for standing up for your rights, and in the process, thanks for standing up for all musicians' rights everywhere. Most importantly, though, thank you for some damn great music. Let's go back even further and go to October 18th. Chuck Berry was born on October 18th, 1926 in St. Louis, Missouri. From the beginning, Chuck was interested in music. He performed during high school, but once he got out of high school, he settled into a normal life, got married, and worked in an assembly plant assembling cars. 
he still had the music bug, so he decided to start performing with the Johnny Johnson Trio. And it was there that he honed his showmanship skills, having studied what blues great T-Bone Walker was doing on stage. One day in May of 1955, Barry went to Chicago. He happened to meet the great Muddy Waters, who told him to have a talk with Leonard Chess of Chess Records. Chess took a look at Barry. They saw that the rhythm and blues section of the genre was beginning to go down in popularity, and they were looking to stretch their sound into new genres. They thought that Barry might be the person to help them do that. He had a bunch of hits in the first decade of his career, from Maybelline to Johnny B. Good to No Particular Place to Go to Rock and Roll Music. Barry geared his music towards teenagers. He talked about good times, cars, girls, and fun. His stage act became legendary, especially when he bent down and hopped across the stage on one leg, which became known as the Duck Walk. And he actually only started doing that because one night during a performance, he thought that his pants had split on stage, so he tried to get around that by doing the duck walk, as it were, in order to hide it. Supposedly. That's the legend. Barry gave rock and roll its swagger before anybody else, even before Elvis Presley. He also made a good living with his touring. In short... Chuck Berry became the template for other artists to follow. One particular song was a call to arms for rock and roll. At that time, classical music, jazz, and standards were all the rage. Rock and roll was beginning to bubble up, and Chuck actually had a lot to do with that. The story goes that Chuck was sick and tired of his sister always using the family piano to play classical music when he wanted to play rock and roll, so he wrote a song about it. He recorded the song on April 16, 1956 for Chess Records. It was part of his Rock, Rock, Rock album, which was supposed to be the soundtrack for a movie of the same name. It was also one of the first songs to name check, as he referred to Louis Jordan and Carl Perkins songs, and to Bo Diddley himself. It was released in May of that year. The song has gone on to be inducted into many songwriting Hall of Fames, and that song was the now classic Roll Over Beethoven. As with most acts, with the good comes the bad, and Chuck Berry was no different. Berry was busted as a child for armed robbery. In 1962, he served one and a half years of a three-year sentence for transporting a minor across state lines. Some believe that it was a trumped-up charge based on racism, and no pun intended on the whole trumped-up thing. He also, later in life, got caught for tax evasion and was also sued for filming women changing their clothes in a bathroom. The latter charge he denied, but the suit was settled out of court. Chuck continued to play almost 100 shows a year worldwide, then cut back to playing at least once a month at a local restaurant near St. Louis. I actually saw him perform at a college spring break concert back in the 1980s at my alma mater, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Towards the end of his life, as one would expect from a man who's lived into his 90s, it was not easy to perform. He lived in Ladeau, Missouri, which was just west of St. Louis. For 18 years, he played that monthly gig at the local restaurant and bar called Blueberry Hill. On October 15, 2014, he played his final gig there. It would be the final full performance anywhere. Chuck Berry passed away in 2017 at the age of 90. Today, he's considered to be one of the great pioneers of rock and roll. When the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inducted its first class in 1986, Chuck Berry's name was front and center on the first ballot. On Rolling Stone Magazine's Greatest Artists of All Times list, he is ranked at number five. Six of his songs made Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time, with Johnny B. Good being the highest at number seven. Johnny B. Good is also the only rock and roll song that was put on the gold record on the Voyager spacecraft that's going out to outer space, and which I believe has now left the incomplete solar system. Father of rock and roll indeed. 
Happy birthday to the father of rock and roll, Mr. Chuck Berry, who was born on October 18th, 1926. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for October 16th through the 22nd. Thank you very much for listening and watching.